We've got Ben and Jasper, um, two researchers here who are about to head out um, to collect some sponge poop. So we'll let them get underway um, and head off. And then we'll start our live investigation looking at ocean acidification on the coral reef. Happy poop collecting. So, <laughs> collecting sponge poop might sound like a really, really odd thing to do, um, but in fact, what sponges do is they take the dissolved um, sh sugars and convert, and by converting them into poop, really, is making them more available to other life on the reef. So they play an incredibly important role. And the research that's being done here is to look at how those um, levels of poop, what's in the poop, how those levels might change um, as environmental conditions or as disturbances happen on the reef. So we're gonna go now back into our live investigation. Uh, and just to see who is joining us, uh, we have uh, schools from Albania, the UK, Indonesia, Switzerland, the USA, India, Thailand, Canada, and Bermuda. Welcome. Um, shout out to Union Point Academy in Kentucky, um, Clarkstown High School, um, North um, New City in New York, um, Congresi e uh, Mana Stirrit um, in Albania, Westport High School um, in Oskola, New Hope School of Zoological and Marine Sciences in Dacula, Shrewsbury International School in Bangkok, Columbus Sioux in Powell, Ohio, Kelowna, Big White School, and Fraser Wood Elementary in Surrey, British Columbia. Welcome, all of you. Great to have you with us. Um, I can see some questions already coming through, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to come to the questions just a little bit later. We're going to start off um, by looking at two um, sort of investigations. And the first one's called ocean acidification in a cup and the second is dissolving coral and vinegar. Um, so we'll come to those each in turn. We're talking about ocean acidification. So what we're wondering in this first investigation is what happens when increased levels of carbon dioxide dissolve in the ocean? So for that, we need a few things. Wherever you are in a classroom, you need an ocean. And so I'm just going to put in my ocean my jam jar or, or, a, or a, um, a cup. Some water. Water out of the tap's fine. But if you do live in a hard water area, so if there's sort of minerals dissolved in the water, distilled water is even better. I'm very lucky to be running this investigation out of a research station where distilled water is available. Let's fill that up. Oh, there we go. About two thirds full. So maybe maybe I'm, I'm slightly too full on that. So there we go. That kind of level there. And I'm just going to put the tops back on the distilled water bottles so they don't blow away into the sea. Um, right, where are we? So this is our ocean, and what we're going to do is we're going to start putting some carbon dioxide into it, and we're going to see how that affects the chemistry, so the acidity level, the pH level of the water. Now, the pH level of the water around here, ocean water averaging about 8.1, pH of 8.1 down from about 8.2 in, in 1750. So we've seen that drop of 0.1 of a unit of pH, and that might not sound like a lot, um, but it represents about a 30% increase in acidity. And we're gonna see what happens if we put 
some carbon dioxide from my breath exhaling into this water. So don't, don't start yet, I'm just going to demonstrate. So it's a gentle bubbling. It's not a massive bubbling, so don't just put the straw in and blow as hard as you possibly can. And this, this will happen if you do that. You get water everywhere, and that's not what we want um, wherever you are. Oh. So, blowing through, and it's, it's incredibly bright sunlight. Um, so, I'm, if, Ellie, I'm very sorry, but I'm just going to need, need a little bit more cream again. So, if you could just wang that to me. Um, so, one of the things you just have to be very careful about working in the tropics, especially a pasty Scotsman like myself um, coming out here, is however much you put sun cream on. It's cloudy sometimes, it's bright sometimes, and just looking after yourself a little bit. Um, if it's not the sun, it's the rain. If it's not the rain, it's the mosquitoes. Um, but it's a pretty glorious place to be, and I'll just scooch that along, along with Jesse here. So back to where we were. The other thing that we need to do is we need to measure how this, this water changes. Now, you might be using um, a pH indicator like um, a red cabbage dye. And if you do that, you probably want to have two jars. One jar to start with, put the red cabbage in that, and then blow through the other one. And at the end, put the same amount of indicator in there. And you can see what the changes might be. If you're using litmus paper, you can see what the changes happen at any stage of this. I'm going to use a pH um, electronic pH meter. So I'm going to turn that on and let's put that in here and see what the pH is. Okay. Now, the weird thing is, is however many times I calibrate my pH meter, I need to turn it on and off again. There we go. And so we're just going to get that first reading from here. And then we can start to look at how, if I blow if I blow through here, what is the pH going to be? So we're starting off again. And we've got pH of 7.5. One, two. Okay. I'm going to blow now, blow through here for a minute, and we'll see how that changes. Oh, don't forget to start my stopwatch. Here we go. There we are. Rest my straw just there using glass straw so we don't get any more plastic into the world. And let's have a look to see how we're getting on here. So from 7.12, I have now gone down by 
Let's see, five da, 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 um, by 0.67, and so that is now 6.45. So I'm not quite sure what's happened where you are, but I'm now finding that if I put carbon dioxide through um, this water, it is becoming more acidic. So we're just going to go and try that one more time, more acidic. If I do it for one more minute, what's going to happen? I've got to do my timer. Here we go, one minute. So let's see where we are now. Hopefully someone noted down where I was before. Uh, it's slowing down slightly. So I've now gone down from by another oof, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 of a unit. Um, and let's see where we're gonna get to next. So one more time, hopefully you're doing as well. It'd be great to hear um, how you're getting on. I'll go, oh, get my timer. Start that again, one more minute. There we go. Put that there. So, we've got another decrease, not quite so much, so down by another 0.1. That's down, bring us down to some low sixes. I wonder what kind of change that you've, you've experienced um, doing this in the classroom. I'm going to put all this down. Put the lid on here. So, what we're seeing here in the ocean, we have huge ocean, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
and what we're seeing is that increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is changing the pH of the ocean. And if we can, can continue on the path we're on, that pH is going to get lower, that acidity level is going to get higher. So that's just one way in which um, the increased carbon dioxide through human activity is changing the pH of the ocean and changing how, how it is that corals can fare. Now, for this we need a, a, a second, second ocean. And I'm going to add a acid to my ocean. This is vinegar. Oh, that's quite a lot of vinegar. Never mind. Oh, shut this. Don't want this tipping into the sea. Now, into our acid ocean, we're going to place some coral. So we're not going to take um, bits of coral that I've got down here. We'll talk about the impact of ocean acidification on these corals in a little, just a little bit. But let's just get a nice pink coral. Here we go. So as we've explained in previous um, sessions, corals make their structure from a mineral called calcium carbonate, turning into limestone. It's the same mineral as um, you find is, uh, chalk's made of. So chalk is calcium carbonate and the uh, coral structure is calcium carbonate too. So what we're going to do is we're just going to break up uh, some of this um, calcium carbonate, this chalk. I'm just going to put my phone in my pocket because it's starting to rain. Um, and Ellie will shout at me if we need to run inside very quickly. So I'm going to put this one in here. And I'll hold it up so you can see what's happening in just a little bit. Okay, leave that one here. So hopefully um, what you can see on the screen is that the calcium carbonate in the chalk, or the chalk, which is calcium carbonate, is reacting with the acid, um, the acidic substance of vinegar. And what we're seeing here is that the calcium carbonate is being returned to the liquid. Normally what happens is that the coral polyp is taking the calcium carbonate from the liquid to form its structure. So we're seeing the opposite happening here. I'm just going to leave that here just so we can sort of think about what might happen to coral if it's in a more acidic um, ocean. And we probably won't get to the stage where the, the, the chemical reaction is really saying, okay, we're just going to dissolve the coral reef um, into the sea. But what happens is it makes the reaction the other way harder. So it makes it harder for the corals to get the calcium carbonate from the ocean to build the structure. So if the coral polyp is finding it more difficult to grow the structure, um, it's used, having to use more energy. If it's using more energy, what we might find is that there's less energy for other things such as growth, um, creating uh, fat reserves in case there's a problem, um, or reproduction. Likewise, the, the building of this um, structure might become a little bit shoddy. Um, and what might happen is that it becomes more brittle as a structure, and if there's a storm, it might be more liable um, to, to be destroyed um, by, by those sort of more wave action because the structure is not so strong. Now, a lot of people um, talking about um, or thinking about coral in a high CO2 world aren't necessarily thinking about ocean acidification. So just to recap, we've seen that increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are changing the pH of our ocean and we've seen here how lower pHs can affect um, calcium, calcium carbonate based structures. This is chalk 
um, but for other uh, for the um, coral reef we've got the the fact that it makes it harder for the coral polyp to create its limestone structure calcium carb uh, sorry carbon dioxide um, is also um, increasing the amount of warmth in the planet and some of that warmth is going into the oceans and many of you might have read um, about um, in just a bit uh, we will get to um, a photo of a healthy reef and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you about how that um, might change um, if there's a change in temperature. Sorry, just going to get my, the, the live, live chat out of my pocket and back with us. Here we are. So, lots of questions through. But let's just take this maize coral here. This is the structure that the coral polyp makes. So you can see this, this is all made by an animal taking mineral from the, from the ocean. And you can see the skeleton, like our skeleton, is white. And in fact, the coral polyp um, is a, like a jellyfish. Um, it's got a translucent body um, related to the jellyfish. And that covers the, the structure like a thin membrane. Okay. So over the surface here. Now, in order to get extra energy, what the coral polyp does, it has a symbiotic relationship with a plant-like organism, single-cell plant-like organism, um, called Suxanthellae. And that is, um, because it's related to plants, it is the colour of plants. So we've got the greens and the browns and the yellows and the reds. And that's typically where the coral polyp gets its colour from, from where the coral gets its colour from. And I'm just wondering whether we are able to see, um, just down below us here, there's a couple of, uh, of these types of corals. Just down beneath me here on, on this pile, um, old pile on, on the jetty. And when they're down here, they are covered in this membrane, these live polyps. And you can see that, that color, that natural, almost like foresty color. Um, you can see the sort of uh, the feeding uh, feeders from a, from, a, from a worm there. Um, and you see little Christmas tree worms. And that's what a sort of like healthy color of reef. Now in bleaching, all that color disappears. So what we're seeing is when the oceans become too warm, the relationship between the coral polyp and, and that sort of plant-like single-celled algae in there, um, that breaks down and those um, algae sort of disappear from the coral and it becomes white. If um, after a few weeks it doesn't become cooler again, then the coral might start to starve to death because the coral is getting a lot of its energy, a lot of its sugar from the um, algae inside of its tissue. And then after that, what we might see is we might see the white skeleton and then if the coral dies, um, then you'll see just the structure and then over time the reef might turn greeny, sludgy brown as it's overgrown with algae. But for now we're just going to have a look at some of those, these are great questions um, that have been sent through. So, Kelly's asked, how does increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere affect coral reefs? Kelly, that's a great question, and we've covered a lot of it. But in summary, we have um, two things that are happening. The chemistry of the ocean is changing through a process called ocean acidification. Atmospheric carbon dioxide reacting with the ocean, creating a, a weak reaction, but um, changing the chemistry, the pH, the acidity of the ocean, and that makes it harder for coral polyps to make their amazing structure. The second is that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere leading to warming, and that warming can lead to the process of coral bleaching, where there's an increase in temperature for a short amount of time, um, and that, can, that leads to the, the algae leaving uh, the coral polyp, and if that lasts for sort of two to six weeks, that can lead to coral mortality and coral death. 
So Kelly, I hope that, I hope that helps help answer your question. Uh, ben, um, is there a risk of all the coral reefs disappearing? If so, how long will that take? There is a risk of all the coral reefs disappearing, um, Ben. And if, this, if we um, let the, the temperatures increase um, by, you know, by the end of the century to the four and a half degrees, five degrees, that kind of thing, if we don't think of ways to reduce our impact on the planet, certainly that's going to have a, an impact on the coral reef. And, and looking at the predictions <coughs> scientists are coming up with, it's going to have quite a significant impact. If so, um, how long will that take? And that, Ben, is uh, ultimately up to us. So um, we, can, we can work together um, as a planet to really think about how we can reduce our impact and to um, lessen, um, decrease the amount of warming that's going to take place. There's conferences happening um, at the moment, intergovernmental agreements, um, and really looking to see how we can reduce our impact and to uh, make sure that um, in future coral life isn't a history lesson. We won't be sitting here going, you know, when we came here in 2018, there was these amazing corals just here. Um, hopefully there'll be more coral just here because we've taken care of our planet a bit more. Sam, um, great question, Sam. Um, can technology help protect corals? Certainly, and it might not be um, the, te the technology you think. So it might be a better uh, sewage treatment or water treatment um, technology that might be in combination with using uh, sponges and other marine organisms. It might be um, electric car technology. It might be new power sources. It might be all those kinds of things that help to decrease our impact um, on the planet. So certainly technology is really part of the solution because it's by decreasing our impact on the planet uh, that we will help the coral reef. Um, Molly, um, is increasing acidity of the water dangerous to humans and other animals? Molly, that's a great question. So when I'm talking about this, this increased um, acidity, I'm not going to sort of put, put my foot in and it's not going to dissolve off. Um, it's, it's, we're not going to be suddenly sort of swimming in, in um, sort of ocean, oceans of, of vinegar or, or, or acid. Um, I think the, if the predictions are looking at sort of you know, current trajectories of carbon dioxide um, increases, we're looking at sort of 7.7, 7.8 pH by the end of the century. That's still above uh, sort of like the, the sort of pH of um, distilled water. But what it does is it makes it harder for a variety of organisms that have a um, calcium carbonate shell or structure because, they're, as I said, they're expending more energy having to do what they've always done. Uh, their shells might become deformed, their structures might become deformed, they might have less energy for growth, less energy for reproduction. So, um, Molly, increasing um, ocean acidity, not so dangerous uh, for humans, but dangerous in so far as if we lose what the ocean gives to us in terms of amazing sort of food and abundance, um, then yes, it could cause um, uh, a problem for um, us as well. Um, but there are a number of other organisms that are having problems um, with um, ocean acidification. Uh, there's a lot of case studies um, on the uh, Washington State um, oyster fisheries. Um, so that's quite a famous case study if you'd like to, to look at that. Um, Bradley, um, is carbon dioxide the biggest threat to corals? Um, and if it isn't, then what do you think is the biggest threat? Uh, Bradley, that's a great question and it's like ranking all these things is really, really difficult. Um, and al although tempting, <laughs> tempting for people to do, like the biggest threat is this or, or whatever, um, I think the first thing to, to do is, is to talk about two different uh, concepts. Uh, the first concept is what I would call sort of systemic or global threats versus local threats. Um, so systemic threats or sort of the changes in, in the global system. Um, that uh, includes warming and that includes um, in, uh, increases in, in, in acidity um, levels. 
Uh, and the second is local threat. So it might be a, a sewage plant, it might be a new port, it might be um, overfishing or destructive fishing, it might be a whole lot of pollution or fertilizer getting in, getting into the ocean. So it's very difficult to say, sort of, on a specific reef, what the biggest, biggest issue are. Um, but the second concept I want to want to talk to you is is what's called a multiple stressor environment. And that sounds like a very complicated way of saying, look, the coral, there might be warming, there might be acidification, there might be some overfishing, there might be some uh, water quality issues. Each on its own might not be massive. It might be something that uh, corals can adapt to or even uh, recover from. Um, but it's just, if it's, you know, this and then that and then something else, that's where uh, the biggest problems are. So we're near human habitation, you've got the, these global systemic threats, and then you've got, wham, you've got some sewage issues, wham, you've got some fertilizer issues from intensive farming, whatever that might be, you've got some overfishing. These all add up uh, and make it much harder, um, sorry, for, 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 for the coral polyp. Uh, next up, we have George. Um, which area of coral reefs are currently the most deteriorated? George, we've had this question a little bit on Coral Live, and, and again, it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, some parts of the, of the Caribbean, we've seen 90, 95% of coral cover gone since the 1950s, with huge, um, huge, huge changes. Um, Jamaica's been particularly badly affected, and, but, you know, also it's one of the more studied reef systems, so, you know, the more study you have, um, the more evidence you have of change, change over time. But really, it, it's those, seems to be those reefs which are closest to human habitation. Take just Curaçao, is that on the eastern tip of the island, away from any development, you've got much better protected and much better conserved um, coral reef, you know, looking like the Caribbean did decades ago. Um, in the Pacific, those reefs that are hundreds uh, of miles from land and underdeveloped um, islands or, or undeveloped islands, so, so those places are going to have a much um, healthier reef system than those which are close to human habitation. Uh, Emily, what is the hardest part about studying corals? I'm gonna, I love I, what I, the hardest part. I was going to say, um, what I love about corals is is that you is that they sort of always com confound you. Um, like you could say that all corals stay in one place, and that's except for the mushroom corals which move, and all, all corals are um, either male or female, and that well except for the corals that are both. Um, or uh, corals are a plant, a vegetable, or a mineral. Well, they're kind of they're kind of a plant because they've got algae inside them that gives them sugars. But they're not a plant because they're an animal. Uh, but they're also a mineral because they create a mineral structure which you can see from space. Um, and then you say, well, they're single animals, each coral polyp. But then they're all connected, um, and they all share their um, their resources between them. And then you can say, well, okay, the way that corals reproduce is they re reproduce asexually. So they just go, well, I'm just gonna split into two and there's gonna be two me's. And then each of those two me's is gonna split into two more me's and you've got four me's. Um, and the process is called budding, but they also reproduce sexually because they um, have sperm and eggs that are broadcast into the water. So the, the hardest thing for me <laughs> about studying coral is that all those rules you get taught about something is this and not this, disappear with coral. You have an animal which is a single animal and a colony that reproduces asexually and sexually that can be uh, uh, male, female or both um, that feeds from having vegetables essentially in its stomach or feeds um, using its tentacles. That for me is the hardest thing. And then the mosquitoes are the second hardest thing. And lots of mosquitoes here. Um, where are we? Um, John, is the increasing sea temperatures um, affecting corals? 
Um, yes, I think we will, we will better look at the difference between um, the live coral and the coral up here. And we, that was, um, you could see the difference in color. And we talked about the processes of um, bleaching with that breakdown um, in re the relationship between the coral polyp and the, this, this plant-like sun belly that lives inside its tissue. Um, uh, Sunny, how can you measure pH using red cabbage? Sunny, that's a great question. You're going to have to find out. Um, so it's a chemical within the red cabbage. Uh, it changes colour depending on the pH of the substance you put it in. So at home, and um, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to boil up a red cabbage in some water, just cover it. It's going to be pretty smelly, so keep the windows open. Um, and then get three clear glasses of water. In one of them, uh, put some uh, baking soda. And in one of them, put the juice of half a lemon. It's like a recipe, isn't it? And then you put the red cabbage in and look at the differences in color. And that's how, that's a chemical reaction um, with the acid or varying acid levels um, in the water. Ronnie, um, what other animals have a calcium carbonate structure? We're looking in the ocean, we have a number of different living things, all the way from single-celled um, algae called coccolithophores um, to shellfish um, like oysters that I mentioned before. So a whole range of uh, organisms in the ocean with calcium carbonate structures. Um, are the particular Lenny, this is a question from Lenny, um, are there particular corals which are particularly vulnerable um, to dissolving? And I think, you know, that's saying, are, are, are some corals um, reacting better or worse to ocean acidification? Getting down to that level of different coral species and how they're reacting um, is um, something I would love to ask Rene. Um, in about an hour's time, he's coming back for an expert interview. And getting down to that species level is something I'm going to have to ask him. So do stay tuned for that or watch on Catch Up on our YouTube channel. Um, here we have um, from uh, Miss Rivenberg. How easy is it to break coral? These are things you should never know how easy it is to break coral. We should be protecting the coral. Um, but I'm just going to show you how these are breaking off here. So the, the, the living membrane only comes down to about here and then you can take this off the reef very, very carefully. That's the same with this one. Obviously there's some shapes um, which are a bit more fragile, some shapes like this flatter coral here were a bit, 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 bit harder. Um, so really, really depends. Uh, where are we? What happens if you step on it? Uh, well, you'll hurt it and it, it could hurt you. Um, so you just, just imagine you're a, a, a membrane or tiny microscopic soft body jellyfish like creatures and you're on this very sharp and if I do that, ouch, um, then you can see there I've already got a blood blister. Uh, from there, there you go. Just, just for life science, we have blood blisters and, and corals and cuts and stuff like that. That's what that's what we do for you guys. Um, and so you're just smushing this poor, soft, soft-bodied um, little animal um, onto onto some sharp surface. It it kills it. Um, I think that the, the the easiest way of putting it. Um, and so please don't step on coral. Um, again, from Ms. Rimbo's class, how does the symbiotic relationship work? And how do organisms work together? Okay. Um, so let's have this, let's have this here, because this is the coral that's easiest to see. So we're remembering the polyp looks a bit like a sea anemone or an upside down jellyfish stuck to the bottom of the ocean. And that's living in this calcium carbonate cup. Now, in the tropics, and you probably have seen the water's pretty nice and clear. I can see some Christmas tree worms down here. If the water were flat, I'd be able to see it even better. But I can see coral from where I'm sitting. Clear waters mean that there aren't very many nutrients or, or wee species plankton in the water. So the coral polyp has 
spread its tentacles out to try and find something to eat and catch it and bring it into its mouth, there isn't much going around. So to build these extraordinary structures, it needs to find some extra energy from somewhere. And it does that with this algae-like creature, the Suxanthelli. Now, symbiosis means that it's good for both um, organisms involved. Like you might have a relationship on the reef that is not symbiotic. The relationship between a shark and a parrotfish is not symbiotic because a parrotfish doesn't get much out of it, although the shark does. So what we have is the... What happens is that there's benefits in both ways. So the algae gets protection by being inside the tissue and also some nutrients um, from the polyp. And what the algae does is it takes energy from the sun and through photosynthesis creates sugars and gives them to the coral polyp. Now that uh, can provide up to sort of 70, 90, even 95% of the coral's energy is coming from the products of, of photosynthesis, so sugars coming from the algae. So it's a sort of equal partnership. Some of the other uh, relationships that you might have heard of on the reef um, is a Nemo relationship. Now we don't find Nemo here in the Caribbean. Nemo is an Indo-Pacific um, fish, but the clownfish has a, a symbiotic relationship with the anemone. So it lives in the anemone. The anemone provides protection with its stinging cells. Um, the clownfish provides the anemone with um, nutrients for its poop and also helps to ward off any predators that might try and come and try along um, and eat the anemone's tentacles. Um, so, um, for some reason, um, Ellie, that there's no, just on the end of the jetty here, I'm four yards away from, from Wi-Fi. Do we have any more questions coming over the live chat? Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, I hope that you have had a, a, an interesting time learning more about um, ocean acidification. I hope you've tried along these investigations in the classroom to see how um, there is a change in the pH of the water um, as you blow through it and to observe what happens when you put a bit of chalk, a bit of calcium carbonate um, in an acid. Thank you so much for being part of this. Do join us um, in just about 45 minutes. Um, at one o'clock local time, you'll have to work out the time where you are, um, where we have um, nearly Dr. Um, Rene back um, to talk about his research into how environmental changes are affecting coral. And then we have an Ask Me Anything um, in a, about um, 45 minutes. We've got that in about two hours time. So I look forward to you joining there as well. Thank you so much for being part of AXA Coral Live. Uh, we're saying now goodbye from the Kamabi Research Station in Curacao. Goodbye.